Welcome to Finding Stuff Out. Today, you get two shows in one. I'm practicing my magic act for my school's talent show. I'm trying to make my guinea pig squeakers vanish into thin air. So far, it's not working, but magic is all about changing stuff into other stuff, right? So maybe your questions about solids, liquids, and gases will help. Here's the first one from Victoria. Why isn't magic real? Whoa! Magic is real! I just saw a magic man burn water! It started to smoke, and he said, if I don't buy a ticket to his next show, he's gonna burn down all our water! Oh. Magic is real! Magic is real! Magic is real! People used to think that anything they couldn't explain must be magic. Get me out of here! Like if you showed someone finding stuff out who had never seen TV before, you could probably convince them that you shrunk me inside your magic box. Hey, yeah! Today, we know that magicians' tricks only look like magic. They all have logical, scientific explanations. Or do they? Is magic real? Maybe it is, and I just don't know how it works. But I promise to find out by the end of the show. Here's my second question. It's from Kevin. Why does a balloon float? Want to see me make this balloon disappear into thin air? But seriously, a balloon doesn't float. What makes it float is the helium. The balloon just goes along for the ride. I found out that the reason helium floats is because it's less dense than other gases in the air, like oxygen. But wait, how can a gas be dense? Doesn't that mean thick and heavy? But if the gases in the air are dense, why can't we see them? Why don't they crush us? My brain is steaming. It's going from a solid to a gas. That can only mean one thing. You're gonna make my head explode. Whew. I found out that dense just means something's tightly packed together. Like when you take snow and smush it into a hard snowball. You've made the snow denser. But some things are naturally denser than others. This maple syrup is full of sugary goodness. Water is less dense, so it floats on top. That's sort of what happens with helium. Helium's lighter than most other gases, so it floats on top of them. Have you ever wondered if you could float through the air using helium balloons? Well, you could if you had enough. Let's see if I can make squeakers float. That's all the balloons I have and they aren't enough. How many balloons would it take to get squeakers off the ground? Let's see. Squeakers weighs about 1,000 grams, and each balloon lifts about 14 grams. Wow, it would take 71 helium balloons just to lift squeakers. And a lot more for his cage. <laughs> I made a guinea pig fly. To lift an average kid, you need about 2,500 balloons. Your parents probably aren't gonna buy you that many at an amusement park. But Kevin, people do float through the air using giant balloons. Only these ones don't use helium. I went to a balloon festival to find out how they float. I'm here with balloon expert Wild Bill. So are these balloons the same as the helium ones that I get on my birthday? No, not at all, Harrison. These here are all cloth-filled balloons. We Just a big bag. All we do is we take the balloon and we fill it up with air. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we superheat the air inside. Right. And then the balloon gets very, very light. Oh, I found out that when you heat the air, it makes it less dense, which is why they're able to fly. Exactly. You've got it. Somebody's been studying. That's good. <laughs> One, two, three, you. Dan, you on the handle? Come on down. You're on this side. Okay. I'm on this side, and we're going to bring this all the way back to where, where okay. the basket is, all right? Keep going until you run out of balloon. After unfolding the balloon... Here we go. We fill it up with air using this giant fan. Then, we turn on the heat with a gas burner. 
Bill has to make sure the flame doesn't get too close to the fabric, which can burn if it gets overheated. We're gonna go in, we're getting in soon. Okay, Harrison, come on board, right in here, man. This is so cool. So how exactly does the heat keep us up? I constantly put heat in because the balloon is always cooling. Right. So if I want to maintain this altitude, I got to put heat in. I'm going to do that right now. So the balloon is now flying in level of flight. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do anything, the balloon will start to cool and we'll start to descend. But if we let the balloon cool too much, then the balloon will come crashing to the ground too fast. <laughs> That's so, not good. So we're going to control the amount of heat we put in right. so we can find a nice soft place up forward here to land. Hey, squeakers, how do you get up here? <laughs> Look at them go. <laughs> I never would have thought those balloons would have gotten you this squeakers, high. Squeakers, man, this is the only way to get around. <laughs> you funny guy. Bye. How do you make water? I am the water monster. I make water with my water monster magic. Just kidding. I found out that water is made up of two gases in the air, oxygen and hydrogen. Here's how they get together. Gas has a dance party swinging through the air. Gas has a dance party. Gas is everywhere. Oxygen and hydrogen shake their derrieres. But a two H's bond with O. They turn to water. Down they go. When two H's bond to O, they turn to water. Look out below. <laughs> So water's made by connecting an oxygen atom with two hydrogens. But if you're wondering how I, Harrison the Magnificent, make water, here's a cool trick. I told my sister I was going to drink mud. She got really grossed out. But she didn't know there was a way to get clean water out of mud. Want to see how the trick works? <laughs> the experiment. This is called a distiller. I let my sister pour the mud into here and told her at the end of the week, I drink whatever liquid came out. But will all the water evaporate before the week is up? Or will I have to drink mud? When the sun heats up the distiller, the water in the mud starts to evaporate. You can see the water vapor fogging up the sides. It's condensing. Then, when it cools off, the vapor turns back into water and drips down into the container. Woo! All the water in the mud evaporated, but the dirt didn't. It all got left behind. My sister will be so disappointed. Nope. Oh. Mm, that mud sure had a lot of water inside of it. You know what else has water? Us. Three quarters of a kid's body is water. That's why we need to drink a lot of it. When you put water in the freezer in a jar, why does it break? It happened to me once. I accidentally put a jar of pickles in the freezer. It broke and made a big mess. But to answer Keon's question without making a mess, it's time for... Uh-oh. Dude, try this at home. Want to know a cool magic trick? Well, it's not really magic, it's science. But you don't have to tell anyone that. You take a plain, ordinary glass of drinking water and fill it all the way to the top. Then, tell your friends and family, prepare to be amazed. I'm going to make this water get bigger. Presto, change -o, water, grow -o. Then, put it in the freezer. When the water is frozen, it will have grown taller than the top of the glass all by itself. See, how did it do that? When a drop of water freezes, it spreads out to form an ice crystal. That's why a jar full of water breaks when you put it in the freezer. If the ice crystals can't go out the top, they break right through the glass. Remember that the next time you're putting away a jar of pickles. 
When you put boiling hot water in a cup and then put it in the freezer and freeze it, can you make it solid, solid, solid? To find out, please welcome my special guest, materials engineer, L.V. Dalgard. Hey, Harrison. Hey, I hope you have pickles in there. I like pickles. Not exactly. If I had pickles in here, they'd be frozen pickles. Oh. Maria wants to know if you can freeze boiling water and put it into really solid ice. Sure, of course. You can change the phase of water no matter what temperature it starts at. In fact, if you're someplace really, really cold and you take a cup of coffee and throw it into the air, some of those droplets are gonna freeze before they hit the ground. Really? And Yeah, and the same thing happens with spit. Cool. Let's do a little experiment. We're, we're not gonna be freezing spit around here, are we? Don't worry. I want you to take these glasses and put them on. Okay because we're gonna be dealing with liquid nitrogen, and liquid nitrogen is kind of like boiling oil. It'll, right. it'll burn your hand if you get it on your hand. Oh. So you're gonna put the gloves on too. It's so cold it burns. Nitrogen, of course, is not dangerous in and of itself. Okay. So you don't have to worry about getting it in your food, which is good, because this is cream and sugar, and we're gonna make ice cream. Wow. And I'm gonna start by pouring a little bit of the liquid nitrogen into the cream and sugar. Whoa. I can't really see. There's so much fog. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be getting, like, frozen. It's getting there, right? Oh, it's getting icy now. You can feel ice chunks in Almost there. Almost ready. Whew. All right, well, if it's too hard to stir, maybe it's ready to, uh, maybe. to scoop yeah, some out hard and taste to... it. There we go. Bon appetit. Mmm. Mm. Well, thank you for this scientific treat. You're very welcome. And here's another question. It's from Brianna. Why doesn't ketchup come out of the bottle sometimes and it makes a big mess? Well, the reason for that is that ketchup is what we call a non-Newtonian fluid. And in this case, that means that it gets thicker if you don't move it. Right. And it gets thinner if you do move it. So is there any scientific way to unstick it? Sure. Hey, that's not exactly scientific. Actually, it is. See, the blockage is in the neck where it's thick. Remember I told you it was a non-Newtonian fluid? Yeah. And if you apply pressure to it, it thins out. Uh. Well, guess what? Thins out in the neck, comes right out of the bottle. Non-Newtonian fluids, those sound cool. Is there any magic tricks I can do with them? Actually. Really? That would be perfect for... My Great Challenge! Today, my challenges are Kobe, Haley and Ashley, Zachary, Mateo, and Colton. So are you guys ready to do something amazing? Yeah! Yep. So if I told you you had to do some jumping jacks or jog for a couple of minutes, that sounds good, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But what if I told you you had to do it on a liquid without sinking? Yeah. Okay. So this is what you guys will be jumping on. It is made up of cornstarch and water. And let me show you something real quick. So if I am to punch it really fast, See, my hand does not sink, it's not wet. But if I slowly put it in, oh, oh. gross. When I say go, the first person on each team has to jump into the pool. And you have a minute of exercises to do, and you have to stay on top of the liquid. When the minute is up, you'll be switching with your teammates. But if you sink before the minute is up, you will be eliminated. The next person in line has to jump into the pool right away and take their place. The last team with a person still standing wins. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Yep. Go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay, you guys are eliminated. Next person in. This stuff is like quicksand. How can they jump on it? I can't get out. The first two challengers are out of the game. Here are the next two. Run and spot really fast. Oh my goodness! <laughs> hey, he has it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh. You're eliminated. Oh, Please okay. switch with your teammate. Oh. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, hurry, get in. Oh, run yes. fast, run faster. There we go. Go, 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 go. Oh. Okay, now let's try some jumping jacks. <laughs> How about just some straight jumping? Just do jumping, go. And switch, green team. Start doing some jumping jacks. 
Now let's try one foot. Oh, yellow, yellow team is eliminated. Green team won. Yeah. So did you guys think you could jump on a liquid? No. No? Well, I'm going to let LV explain why you could. OK, well, the way it works is we call this cornstarch and water together a non-Newtonian fluid. It gets thicker or thinner if you change the stress, if you hit it. So with ketchup, it gets thinner when we hit it. But with this, it gets thicker. Think of it like you're trying to run into a crowd of people, right? right? If you run really fast, you're just going to bang into them all. But if you go slowly and give them time to get out of your way, you'll be able to go through them. So it's the same thing with this. If you go really fast, you're just going to bounce off it. Well, thanks for playing my great challenge. And thank you, Elvie, for helping us find stuff out. You're welcome. Can a solid turn into a gas? I checked the answer and... Whoa. Everyone, please welcome magician Ryan Lalonde to my show. Hi, Harrison. Thanks for having me. Welcome. Happy to, happy to be here. Uh, sorry my hands are dry. Uh, do you have any moisturizer with you? I actually don't, sorry. OK, um, I guess I'll just use the moisture in the air. How? Well, here, I'll show you. Uh, my hand is empty. I'm going to make a fist. OK. And I'm just going to grab the water. See? What? The water and put it all in my hand. And you're going to see. How, how are you doing this? You must have something up your sleeve, right? Not quite. A magician never tells his secret. Basically, what I did is I turned a gas into a liquid. Let me try something. I have a silk, mm -hmm. which would be a solid. Right. I will put the solid into the glass. Now I have a white silk, mm -hmm. which I can turn into white milk. Is that one of those tricks where you make the audience look away and, and while they're not looking, you do something really fast? Harrison, you're a tough audience. There must be a scientific explanation. Dahlia was wondering, can you turn a solid into a gas? I think you can. Let me try something. Whoa, how'd you do that? Well, it's very simple. I use what magicians call flash paper. Right. It has uh, particles in the paper that, uh, that are flammable and help the paper disintegrate. Right. When paper burns, gases are formed. Don't you burn yourself with that? No, magicians have very safe ways of doing tricks. That's why kids should never copy the tricks they see on TV or in movies. I can show you something else about turning a solid into a gas. Right. Those are frozen blocks of carbon dioxide, also called dry ice. Whoa, it's bubbling and, and there's smoke coming out of it everywhere. So, Dahlia, the water warmed the solid carbon dioxide, and that made it turn into a gas. Oh, and I just thought of another example. A normal ice cube is solid, but when it melts, it turns into water. If that water gets hot enough, it turns into vapor. So water can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas, depending on the temperature. What I have here is two glasses full glass of room temperature water mm -hmm. and an empty glass. So we're going to put this white piece of paper over the glass okay. to make sure we know that this is the original empty glass. Now I'm going to pour about half the water, maybe just a little more, into the glass. Now the purpose of this trick is to see if I can actually freeze the water in the glass. You're going to see that it is actually frozen. <laughs> well, there must be a scientific explanation to that, too. Elvie already showed me how you can freeze things really fast. I guess you just don't believe in magic. Oh, that reminds me. I still have to answer Victoria's original question. Why is not magic real? The big answer is magic is real. Sort of. I can't wave a magic wand and make squeakers disappear. The tricks magicians do aren't real. Hey, whoa, Harrison. They're illusions, even if I can't explain how they're done. But the real world is pretty magical if you think about it. Think of all the stuff we saw that is real. Gas is turning into liquids. Liquids turning into solids. Solids turning into gas. 
Gas has even lifted me into the air. So even if I couldn't make Squeakers disappear... Squeakers? Where did he go? Squeakers? Squeakers? Whoa, whoa, Harrison, Harrison, did you check your hat? Where? How'd you do that? I didn't see you do that. Well, you're not supposed to. It's magic. Hey, it's empty. What have you done with Squeakers now? My name is Squeakers, hey. and this is my show. Squeakers? How did you get there? I can't believe this. See you next time for more finding stuff out. Ryan, there has to be a scientific explanation to this. I'm in this watery world because of a question from Emily. Will water ever be extinct? I don't know, Emily, but I've been thinking about water, mainly because a water line broke in my street, so they turned my water off. But before they did, I managed to fill up all these containers. Hopefully, by the time they turn the water back on, I'll be able to answer your question. Now, here's a question from Vanessa. How come we can't talk or breathe underwater? Why can't we talk or breathe underwater? Well, Vanessa, I found out for you. When we talk, our voice makes sound vibrations. What I'm trying to say is that we don't hear very well underwater because our eardrums need to vibrate, but underwater, they don't vibrate as well. And the reason we can't breathe underwater is that while both air and water have oxygen, our lungs can't get oxygen from the water, and fish's gills can't get oxygen from the air. But wouldn't it be cool if you could breathe in both places? <laughs> now here's a question from Luisha. Why do people need to have water? If you're a fish, then you need it for breathing and living in. But humans use water for lots of things. We need to drink water because most of our body is made up of it. About this much. Hey, whoa, how did he get in there? Anyway, I feel a song coming on. H2O. to our whole body. It lubricates our joints and dissolves our food. Carries off our waste so we stay feeling good. We lose it when we poop and sweat and also when we pee. So we need this much water daily. H2O. We use water to have fun, too. Like swimming and playing a whole bunch of sports. And most of all, we use it to grow food. Vegetables, fruits, and farm animals all need clean, fresh water. We also use water to stay clean. To cook, to make electricity, to paint, to heat our houses, to travel, to drink, even for flying. Water's everywhere, in everything. Water's also nice in a cool cloth after your head explodes. <sighs> but I realize that because it's so precious, we have to use it wisely. So, Luisha, your question inspired me to go and get some... <laughs> what I want to know is, who are the biggest water wasters in your home? My sister, because she goes into the bathroom to do her makeup, but she has the tap running and she doesn't need the tap running. Me, because when I water the garden, I goof off with the hose instead. Probably me, because sometimes I leave the water on while I'm brushing my teeth. Me, because when I take a shower, like, I keep it on the hot and like I'm in there like for 20 minutes. Probably me and my brother, because sometimes in the summer, we'll use our slip and slide. And then afterwards, we'll go inside like to dry off and have a snack. We'll just leave it running, and that wastes a lot of water. Looks like we should all stop wasting water. All we gotta do is turn off the tap. Now here's a helpful question from Matthew. How does water beat fire? 
To find out why water beats fire, I've come here to meet firefighter Mark Messier. Hi Harrison, welcome to Station 36. Harrison, you've got a fire to go to. Let's go, we gotta go. Let's go. Taking me to a real fire. This is the training center. This is where you train firefighters, so we're gonna train you to put the fire out. Okay, so take the nozzle. Okay. Take some hose. Okay, you have one hand on there, one hand on here. Yeah. When he when it's full, you go ahead and open it up a little bit. Okay, now we got water. Okay. That's it. And spray the whole thing, go around in circles if you want. What we do is we can roll around to the other side, make sure we get all the whole side. That's it. We want to cool down the fuel and that will put the fire out. There you go. Now we can stop, see if there's any more smoke. A little bit on the head. It's still smoldering oh, a little bit, top, and that's yeah. normal. To answer Matthew's question, how did the water beat the fire? So basically, when we look at a fire, it's like a triangle. You need fuel, you need heat, and you need oxygen in order to have a fire. By eliminating any one of those three, the fire goes out. So what did we do here? Well, let's see. We didn't remove the fuel. The wood's still there. We didn't remove the oxygen. The air is still all around us. We took the water, which eliminated the heat. That's correct. And that put out the fire. That's exactly what happened. Nice. Good job. Now we're going to try to put out another kind of fire, a grease fire. We can't fire, extinguish all fires with water, because some fires will actually make it quite dangerous if we use water. Watch this. Oh, that looks really dangerous. It is. When people have a grease fire in their kitchen, the best thing for them to do is just to get out of the house and call 911 as soon as they can. Right. Well, I'm sure there's some other way to put this fire out. Yes, there is, by removing the oxygen. So what we're going to use is a carbon dioxide extinguisher. OK. And you're going to put out the fire. Awesome. Carbon dioxide is the same gas that makes fizzy drinks fizzy. All right, so you ready? Yeah, let's do this. OK, let's go. Ready? Because it doesn't burn and is heavier than air, it sticks to the base of the fire and pushes the oxygen away. Whoa, that was difficult to put that one out. No, but you managed to do it. So when we look at our fire triangle, we have heat, oxygen, and fuel. What did right. you do here? Uh, we sprayed it with the carbon dioxide, which got rid of the oxygen. That's correct. We displaced the oxygen, so the fire has to go up. Nice. Good job. Okay, here we're going to have a propane fire. Now, we can't put this out with water. However, we'll use water to keep the tanks cool, and we'll use it as a shield so we can get close enough to turn the fuel off. Oh, that's like the last part of the triangle. You just have to eliminate the fuel. Exactly, and you're the one who's going to be turning it off. Nice. Uh-oh. You have got to be kidding. To put that out, I'm going to need some special safety equipment. Okay, now there's some clips back here. We're going to tighten. Oh, like that. Okay. Now, okay. I checked you. I want to make sure I see no exposed skin. Something goes wrong, we need to make sure that you're covered. Let's do this. The gas leaking out of those tanks is on fire. The firemen will hose it off to make it cool enough to touch. My job is to turn off the valve and stop the flow of gas. But first, we have to get closer. That's the valve I have to turn off. I did it! Fire's out! Ooh, that was hot. Thanks so much for being on my show. Hey, no problem. Thanks any time for coming. But you never ask me the one question, how do we cool down after it's really hot? How do we cool down after it's hot? Well, you really want to know? Yeah. I guess that's a pretty good way to cool out. <laughs> Here's another question that's all wet. Why is the water clear but the ocean blue? Yeah, what gives? 
This glass of water doesn't have any color in it. Or does it? To help me find out... She knows about water, and she promised not to dump it on me. Please welcome Roxanne Mirage. Hi, Harrison. Today we're going to talk about water. All right, but you're not going to dump that on me, are you? No, I'm not a firefighter. So, this is clear water, but I was hoping you could bring blue water to help me find the answer to the question. Actually, all water is blue. You gotta think of the sun sending down all its light like a rainbow into the ocean, but the only color that's actually being reflected from the water is blue, and that's why the ocean is blue. So I guess you need a lot of water, like a lake or the ocean, to see the blue. Just one glass isn't enough. Absolutely. But what about all these colors, like this one? Oh, that one, that's Lake Roatura in New Zealand. It's covered in little tiny microscopic plants called algae that are green and they're reflecting the green color. Right, so that's why it's green, it reflects the green light. What about this one? Oh, isn't that one pretty? That one's Lake Hillier. It's in Australia. It's very, very, very salty. It's like 10 times saltier than the ocean. And the little tiny microscopic plants growing in this lake actually reflect the colors more like orange and red. So it ends up being pink with the salt and stuff combined? Exactly. Okay, and what about this one? It's black. This lake is actually on top of a volcano. The water is coming in from underneath, and what's happening is it's gathering all the minerals from the rock, right. and because it's a volcano, the rock is really black and mineraly. Right, from like ash and stuff. Exactly, and so that's why it gets this black color. Right, well I have one more. It's rainbow. Oh, Harrison, you're such a joker. <laughs> okay, so what about this water? It's green, is that because of the algae you mentioned earlier? Absolutely. Well, let's take a look at this with my super zoomomatic. Oh, cool. So algae are little tiny microscopic plants, so you have to think of them as being like leaves of a tree, but they're really, really tiny. You can only see them with a microscope or your super zoomomatic. <laughs> and they're the ones that are capturing the sunlight's energy and producing the food that all the animals living in water rely on to eat. Right, and what about this water? It's all brown. Yeah, that water is swamp water. Oh, it smells horrible. I know, I know. Well, what happens is swamps are characteristic of a lot of things coming into it and dying. And as they die, they get all broken down and the color becomes brown. Well, I wouldn't want to drink that. And Devin had a question about that. How can you make river water safe to drink? Some rivers are actually safe to drink right away, but most rivers you should take some precautionary treatment before right. drinking them. I have my filtration set up that I use when I want to go and study lakes. Right. And what we're going to do is we're going to pour a little bit of this water, which looks relatively clear. It has a little tinge of green. Kind of, kind of green there. Yeah, I wouldn't drink that directly, yeah. <laughs> so let's remove some stuff. Okay, so pour it in there. Let's get the filter pump going. And what I have in here is a little fine mesh filter right. that is capturing all the particles. So let's stop that. And let's take a look. Whoa, it's all green. That's the algae being caught up. Now, another way to make water safe is by boiling the water. Boiling water, how does that help? Well, you get the water up to such a high temperature that the, all the microorganisms or bacteria die. Right, so, and then it's safe to drink. Then it's safe to drink. So would you like to kill some bacteria? Sure. Let's go for it. So Harrison, the river water is now boiled, and now I'm gonna make tea. And tea is actually gonna explain why that swamp water we have over there is turning brown, because oh, tea- Oh, it's brown. That's right, tea are just dead leaves. Just like there's dead leaves in swamp water, dead leaves make tea. Absolutely. Would you like a cup of tea? Oh, why, yes. A cup of dead leaves would be wonderful. My pleasure. Smashing. This one smells much better. Thanks for being on my show. My pleasure, Harrison. Now here's a question from Mia. How does rain come down from the clouds? The Flat Earth Corner! Hey, you farmers. Are your crops brown because it hasn't rained in months? Are your animals thirsty? Do you not have any water? No problem. Give me all your money and I'll make it rain with this Rainomatic Air Cannon. Why, this is no ordinary cannon. <coughs> what a bar 
Morgan. <laughs> Less than a hundred years ago, people believed there were rainmakers that could actually make it rain. It didn't work. Serious scientists tried it too, with a process called seeding clouds, but that didn't really work either. If there's no moisture up in the air, then you can't make it rain. Simple as that. Here's the real way rain falls from the clouds. The sun heats water in the ocean's rivers and lakes. The tiny droplets evaporate and rise up in the sky to form clouds. If enough water gathers up there, it gets too crowded for all that water, and it falls back down to Earth, starting the cycle all over again. But rain doesn't fall evenly all across the world, as Evan's question points out. How come some countries in the world don't have that much water, yet most of the world is filled with water? Most of our planet is covered by water. That's why it looks blue when you see it from space. So it seems like there should be enough water for every country in the world. But here's the thing. Let's say this is the entire amount of water that's in the world right now. Nearly all of it would be salt water in oceans. We can't live by drinking salt water. Our bodies can't take that much salt, and we can't use salt water to grow crops or raise animals either. So how much is left of fresh water? The stuff we use for farming and drinking. Only about this much. But there's a catch. A lot of that fresh water is locked up in icebergs and glaciers. And what's left for us out of all the water in the world is about this much. I'm starting to see why some countries have less water than others. So because water isn't spread out evenly in the world, and some people have to work really hard to get their water, that gives me an idea for... My Great Challenge! Today's challenge might get very messy and very wet. And today's challengers are Michaela. You're going down. And Sam. All right. <laughs> All right. In North America, each person uses this much water every day. That's for drinking, washing our clothes, or cars, and watering the lawns. It's crazy. What if I told you you have to carry that much water on your head? Whoa. Watch this. People in some parts of the world spend as much as four hours a day carrying water from wells to their homes. Some people get so good, they don't even have to hold on to their bucket. As a matter of fact, that's today's challenge. You have this bucket, and you have to dunk it into this well, get as much water as you can, and then put it on your head and walk all the way to those jugs over there without spilling it. You'll have two minutes, and the one that fills the jug up the most will be the winner. Okay. But there's a catch. You cannot touch the bucket while it's on your head. If you do, you'll have to restart back over here. What's this for? This is to help balance the bucket on your head. Are you guys ready? Set, go! <laughs> Touch the bucket. Oh, yeah. There's one, there's one. Going for bucket number two. Oh, oh, come back, come back. <laughs> oh, let go of the bucket. Oh, no. <laughs> Make sure to let go of the bucket right before you start marking. <laughs> They each have one bucket right now in, in their jugs, but let go of the bucket. Okay, okay. <laughs> oh, Michaela's almost there. Yeah. We have about a minute left. Oh, look at that, speed run. <laughs> Michaela's going for her third bucket, and so is Sam. Oh. They're tied right now. Sam's getting ahead. Oh! This is a close race. Oh! <laughs> Ten seconds. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One! Okay, time's up! <laughs> All right, let's see who the winner is. So, it looks like Sam has about two and a half liters of water, and Michaela, three liters. You're the winner! Oh yeah, I told you you're going down. You really did. What was the hardest part of the challenge? Well, it was kind of keeping the water on your head, because like you're trying to run, and it's a race, so 
it's hard to keep it on your head. It was hard to like to put the right amount of water because if it's too heavy, it'll tip over, and if it's too light, it'll tip over too because there's not enough weight on your head. So would you like to carry that much water on your head for four hours every day? No. Not really. <laughs> really makes you think about not wasting water, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for being on my great challenge and helping me find stuff out. That was really fun. Yeah. <laughs> People aren't the only living things that have to worry about how much water they use. Here's a question from Angela. How does a cactus produce water when there is no water in the desert? I checked, and here's what I found out. These cactuses manage to live in deserts where other plants would die, because there's not enough water. Cactuses do it by storing water and using it very carefully. This cactus doesn't have any leaves, so it doesn't lose water through them like other plants do. But the cactus can't make any water. It can only store water. So that brings me back to the question that started me on this watery quest. Will water ever be extinct? The big answer is... Yes and no! There's lots of water around, but not all are in forms that we can use. All of the water that's on Earth has been here since the Earth was formed. There's no new water being made. So even though there's a lot of water, we still have to conserve it and make sure it's clean because there's only so much of it. Hey, sounds like my water's back on. Guess I won't have to break you open after all. Ow! I wasn't actually gonna break you open. Thanks for watching Finding Stuff Out. Ow! I don't even like cactus water. Ow! Whoa, this lump of coal is hard. You're probably wondering why I'm trying to squish it anyway. Well, it's because of a question I got from Benjamin. When you squish a piece of coal, how does it turn into a diamond? Hmm, how does a piece of coal turn into a diamond when you squish it? I don't know. I don't even know if it's possible. But coal is carbon and diamonds are carbon. So, I'm gonna find out the answer because if I can turn this coal into a big sack of diamonds, oh, yes, I'm rich. I'm rockin' rich. <laughs> Diamonds are one of the most valuable rocks in the world. Kings used to put them in their crowns, and today they're used in fancy jewelry. The most famous diamond in the world is called the Hope Diamond. It's supposed to have a curse. <laughs> Diamonds are hard to find though, so if I want to have some, I'll have to make them. Hmm, I guess I have to do more research. Meanwhile, here's a question from Madison. What's the difference between rocks and minerals? I checked, and rocks are made out of minerals, but minerals aren't made of rocks! Wait, what? How can rocks be made of minerals, but minerals aren't made of rocks? Do scientists have rocks in their head? Brain getting warm, brain starting to go volcanic! <laughs> You're gonna make my head explode! It might sound confusing, but I checked, and it works sort of like this. Minerals are like the parts of a sandwich. The bread is just bread, lettuce is just lettuce, the cheese is just cheese, and the tomatoes are just tomatoes. But if you put them all together... And you make a sandwich. And this one's got my name on it. Mmm, that's good too. Rocks are like the whole sandwich. Put some minerals together and it's a rock. Also, nope. don't talk with your mouth full, especially if you're doing a television show. Now here's a question from Leo. How does a rock become a rock? How does a rock become a rock? Let's answer it with some hard rock. Rock cycle, time to get down. Rock cycle, down in the ground. When the pressure starts, the things get hot. You're gonna get molten rock. Smushed up minerals all combined to make the different rocks you find. Mountains are born, then they get born down. New rock, old rock, switches around in the rock cycle. Yeah, rock on, rock it out. Now here's a question from Munir. How many kinds of rocks exist in the world? I don't know, Munir but I know someone who does, and he rocks. Please welcome Matt Herod. Oh, hey. Cool rocks. Oh, thanks, Harrison. They rock. Rocks! 
So how did you get started into collecting rocks? So I started when I was 10. I was given a little kit of different minerals as a Christmas present, and that got me really interested in learning all about rocks, reading all about them. Okay, so to answer Munir's question, how many rocks are there in the world? So there are three types of rocks on Earth. There's igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rocks. Igneous rocks form when we melt other rocks, like in a volcano or something. This rock has quartz, feldspar, and mica. Wow, so that could have come out of a volcano? That's right, when this rock cooled, those three minerals formed. This is a sedimentary rock, and you can see it's just like a big bunch of mud all like hardened together. Sedimentary rocks form when we break apart other rocks, right. and the sand or the mud that forms washes down a river, and eventually it settles down, and then eventually it hardens to form a sedimentary rock. The final type of rock is metamorphic rocks, and they're formed when we take an igneous rock or a sedimentary rock and we bury it really, really deep in the earth. I found out that it's super hot in the middle of the earth. So these kinds of rocks melt down there and get squished together, right? Exactly. All that heat and all that pressure causes it to change into a metamorphic rock. So that's three ways that rocks can get made. But how many kinds of rocks are there altogether? Well, when we change the way that they form, different conditions, we can get all sorts of different combinations and make thousands of different types of rocks. This is your collection of rocks here. Is this your full collection? No, I have so many more rocks back home. I haven't filled up my attic, but I certainly filled up the basement and the garage. <laughs> well, Tatiana had a question about some rocks that are out of this world. Are rocks different on other planets than Earth? That's a great question. Some rocks on other planets are a lot like the ones we find on Earth. Others are completely different. So today I brought with me a sample of a meteorite. You mean a rock that fell to Earth from outer space? Exactly. Why are you putting that glove on? Because the grease on our fingers can actually contaminate the outer surface of that meteorite right. or ruin it if scientists want to analyze it. So here's the meteorite I brought. And you can see on the outside, it's all burned and brown. Yeah. Like, you, like I just took it out of my oven. But that's actually from when it flies through the earth, it starts to heat up and then it gets this outer brown color on it. That's called the crust. So this meteorite's been cut in half and we can see that the inside is all speckled with different types of minerals inside. Munir, Matt says that the rocks astronauts brought back from the moon and the ones that were studied on Mars show us that rocks from space can be different from ours on Earth. But scientists think that the minerals they're made out of are the same everywhere in the universe. In fact, we believe that there might even be a planet that's made of diamonds. A planet made of diamonds? If you found that planet, you'd be so rich. Yeah, it's really, <laughs> really far away, though. That reminds me of a question from Malinka. Why are some rocks worth more than others? Yeah, so why are some rocks worth more than others? So the first reason is rarity. If it's really hard to find, and if there's not very much of it, right. then it's gonna be worth more. The second is if it's really useful. If it's a mineral that can be used for something right. to help people, then it's gonna be worth more. Oh, I heard iron ore helps make steel, which is used to build things like bridges and cars. Is that why it's worth more? Exactly. And the third reason is it costs more to get out of the earth, then it's going to be more valuable. That's why diamonds are so expensive, That's right? right. Diamonds are really hard to get out. They're really rare, and they're both pretty and desirable and useful. Cool. Can you stick around to help me find more stuff out? Yeah, my pleasure. Awesome. Now here's another question. This one's from Gianni. What do you use rocks for? So Gianni asked me what rocks and minerals, like metal, are used for. I thought of some answers, but I was hoping these guys could help me figure out some other things that are made out of rocks. Pyramids, railings, earrings, fences, houses, garbage cans. Gold and metals, like for the Olympics. The kettle that you make tea or coffee in. Cars and some lamps. Watches and lamp posts. Cement. Pots, pans, statues, wedding rings, TVs. Almost everything are made out of rocks. Wow, you sure use a lot of rocks. So, Gianni, to answer your question, looks like we couldn't get by a single day without using rocks. That's a lot of rocks! 
Here's a question from Victoria. I like to have some gold. Where can I find some? The Flat Earth Corner! In medieval Europe, scientists called alchemists thought they could actually turn common metals like lead into expensive metals like gold. They thought all you had to do was add mysterious chemicals and... Ta-da! Huh? Nothing happened. Wait, that was the chemical for my invisibility potion. You can still see me. Good. Okay, so now you take a little sprinkle of this and turn the cheap piece of lead into a priceless mess. For hundreds of years, people thought they could make gold out of cheap metals like lead, but it didn't work. Actually, Victoria, there's a lot of gold in the world, but it's usually mixed in with other stuff in very tiny amounts. In a gold mine, they mine tons of rock and take all the little bits of gold out of it. Another way miners find gold is by panning for it in streams. And that's today's... My Great Challenge! All right, today my challengers are Zach... Yeah! ...and Brianna. Woo! You're gonna pan for gold like real miners. Also, Matt came in because he helped me build a stream. Streams are a great place to find gold. Gold, when it washes out of rocks, is so heavy, it washes down streams and it sinks to the bottom and gets caught in the sands and the gravels. So then all you have to do is come and scoop it out. And look what I brought with me. Whoa! Did you find that in a stream? Oh, I wish. I had to chip this out of a rock. Mm. This is a mineral called pyrite, or fool's gold, and it looks just like gold. And it's even fooled some miners in the past. All right, so we don't have pyrite for you, but we have actual real fake gold for you to find. Are you pumped to find real fake gold? Yeah! We're gonna get fake rich! <laughs> all right, take your positions. You'll have two minutes to pan all of this water and find as much gold as you can. The one who finds the most gold will be the winner. Are you ready? Yeah. Three. Two, one, go! That's right, guys. Swirl that water around and find the gold. Getting a lot of sand yeah. there, Adrian. Swirl, swirl. Any <laughs> water? It's cold. It's cold. <laughs> you really need to get a lot of water so you yeah, can yeah, yeah. get rid of the sand, right? And find the gold. That's right. Brianna's got some. She's off to a great start. She'll be fake rich in no time. Zach has some too, but he's got some catching up to do. Remember, the more you swish, the more you can fake rich. That gold is super heavy. It's always at the bottom of the pan. Get more, get more, get more water. Keep going, keep panning. More water, that's the trick. Brianna's looking for that buried treasure. Look at that. Zach's got some more. He might be catching up. Brianna likes to dig through the sand to find her gold. Zach has a different way of doing it. He likes to swirl the water around. It's all technique. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Time's up. Oh, I had this. <laughs> That's not even oh. gold. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, well. So Good. close. You dropped it. <laughs> all right, let's see who got the most gold. Zach, let's weigh yours. 11 grams. Whoa. How much would that be worth if it was real gold? That's like $500. My precious. <laughs> and Brianna, let's weigh yours. 26 grams. Whoa. That's like $1,100 of real money. <laughs> You're the winner. Yes. Congratulations. But I guess you both win because you get to keep the real fake gold. <laughs> <laughs> so would you guys like to do this all day for your job? Pan for gold? No, thank yeah, you. Yeah, because no. then I'd just keep it. <laughs> <laughs> and then it'd be real gold, right? Yeah. Thanks yeah. for playing. Now here's a question from Joseph. How do rocks grow? Hmm. rock a -bye, baby. Rocks. Come on, little baby rocks. Grow. I've been watering these rocks for days now, but still nothing. I bet you think this is silly, but there really are types of rocks that do grow. 
Can rocks grow? To find out, I'm going deep inside some caves. And to show me around, here's Riles Forest. Hey, Riles. Hi, Harrison. You excited to go caving today? Yeah, so where are you going to take me? Trevor and I are going to show you through Riverbend Cave, which is the deepest cave here at Horn Lake. Let's go caving. Sure, but what about non-rocky things like bats or, or bears or something? Don't worry, we won't find any, except for maybe some moths, cave crickets, or spiders. I wonder if there'll be diamonds. Can rocks grow in there? Yeah, we're gonna see some pretty cool different things. I'll show you. I think caving's really cool that you can go in a place that not many people have been in before, and you can explore different places and have crazy adventures sometimes. You never know what's around the corner. This is a cool ladder. Woo! <laughs> ah. This is so cool. Wow. Can you see rocks growing in here? All this white, pretty stuff you see hanging from the roof and on the walls, you can always see them growing. It's called calcite. So it's when the water flows through the cave and then picks up bits of calcium. And the rock has the calcium because it's made of dead sea animals, their shells and bones. So when the water picks up the calcium and then drips from the ceiling, it'll leave a little ring. And then over years, it'll build up and then get longer and longer. And that's like a stalactite, right? Yeah. Cool. And then if it still has some calcium left, it'll drip onto the ground and form a stalagmite. Stalagmite, stalactite. So how can you tell the difference between them? Stalactites stick tight to the roof. Stalagmites might reach the top one day. Or C for ceiling, G for ground. Cool. And then when they connect, they form a column. A column. So that would be from like the floor all the way up to the roof. Yep. It doesn't look like they're growing right now. But they are. They grow 2.5 centimeters every 100 years. Wow. That's not very fast. And that's, that's not very the fast. fastest one. Oh, that's the fastest one? Yeah. So we won't be able to see them grow with our eyes. No. Still really cool. There's also lots of other calcite formations, like draperies, bacon strips. There's a cave crocodile. A cave wolf. It's amazing, all the different ones. Yeah. I got one other cool thing to show you. Come on. Cool. There we go. There's water! There's water! Waterfall water. Yeah, so this formation we're coming up to is called the Ice Cream Waterfall. It's actually three stories tall. Wow, this is so cool. Oh, and it looks like there's diamonds. Don't touch it. If you touch it, it'll kill it, because calcite is like crystals, kind of. Mm -hmm. So when the water flows through with the calcite, it'll catch on the crystals and keep building up bigger and bigger. But if you touch it, it'll break them down, and the oils from your skins will break them down, so if you touch it, it can't grow anymore. Oh, that's so no good then. kill it. Oh, no. The crystals look a lot like diamonds. Are you sure they're not diamonds? I'm sure. <laughs> Is there diamonds in caves, though? Some caves in other parts of the world, you can find diamonds, but not in these caves. Darn. So you wouldn't happen to know how to squish coal into diamonds, would you? No, sorry. Darn. Well, thanks, Riles, for being on my show and showing me all these cool caves. Thanks for being interested into caves. Oh, and I know one more thing that caves and rocks are really good for. Having fun! So it turns out that rocks really can grow. And that's the subject for today's... <laughs> the experiment! I'm going to see if I can grow my own rocks the same way they grow in a cave. I have two jars of water here in which I am dissolving Epsom salts. Then I'm taking this string with two weights attached to each end so that it'll sink to the bottom of each jar. Then I'm gonna slide this plate underneath and wait. 
As you can see, a week later, I've grown some stalactites. And the start of some stalagmites, pretty cool. Going to the caves with Riles was pretty fantastic, but I still want to turn coal into diamonds. So I'm trying to squish it using these elastic bands. And in a minute, I'll reveal it, and then answer the question that started me on this rocky road. When you squish a piece of coal, how does it turn into a diamond? Well, Benjamin, the big answer is... Ah, oh, it's just coal. Sorry, Benjamin. But if there's any way to turn this into a diamond, I bet I know who can tell me. Hey, Matt, I have a question. Yeah, sure, Harrison. I was trying to make diamonds out of this coal because I heard people can do it, but I couldn't do it. Well, it takes a lot more than rubber bands and hope to make diamonds out of coal, Harrison. Surprise, Matt says that most diamonds are not made from coal. They're actually made from other kinds of carbon material, deep underground under very high temperatures and pressures. But now, scientists have found a way to make them in special labs. The way they do it is they take carbon, like coal, mm -hmm. and they heat it and they squeeze it at tons of pressure and heat, and they try to simulate the same conditions that we see in nature. And voila, man-made diamonds. Are synthetic diamonds like that worth as much as real diamonds? No, there's no replacement for nature. Well, thanks for helping me find stuff out, even though you couldn't help me make a fortune in diamonds. No problem. Well, let me give it a try. Sure. What? How did you do that? Magic hands. It's gone. Rock on, Harrison. Wow. Hey, Rocky, check out what happened at the cave. So just remember, if you're going down and you kick a rock down, just remember to yell, rock, so that everybody below you knows not to look up when the rock's falling down. Hey, you know what? This is really cool. This rocks. This rocks. What? Rocks? Sorry, I was just getting really excited about the rocks. Oh, okay. See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out.